Today we're going to talk about targeted grazing and rangeland principles here at the University of Idaho. Targeted grazing really has been occurring since livestock were domesticated centuries ago. We have used animals for their meat and wool and, and, uh, and animal products, but we've also used them to manage vegetation. So that idea of using animals to manage vegetation and improve landscapes is called targeted grazing. So I'm Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho. Today we're going to talk about targeted grazing. So as I mentioned, livestock have been produced for 10,000 years or so to produce products like meat and wool and hide uh, to be used for human by humans. Recently, however, in the last decade or so, we started thinking a lot more about using livestock to manage plant communities. I think this came about because we started learning since about the 80s and 90s, we learned the principles of animal behavior, and now we can take those principles and we can apply them in really specific settings to manage plant communities. That was the birth of targeted grazing. So targeted grazing, it's not your run-of-the-mill, everyday, garden variety kind of grazing. It's the application of a specific kind of livestock at a determined season, duration, and intensity to accomplish a well-defined vegetation or landscape goal. So it's really just turning down the small dials that really make grazing effective and targeted on a specific goal to accomplish in a landscape. The, what's cool about targeted grazing is that in order to do a really good job, you have to be good at two things. You have to really understand vegetation on the landscape and understand what kind of landscape you want the, to have. What's your goal? And you also have to understand a lot about grazing animals. So targeted grazing is just somewhere in between that fissure between landscape understanding and animal understanding. Okay, as I mentioned, landscape uh, goals and using livestock to manage landscapes have been used for a long time. We've used livestock to reduce weeds on crops and pasture lands and wildlands. Oh, since the the 40s, at least 1940s, we've been using livestock to control herbaceous biomass in tree crops, both pine plantations and orchards. Uh, we've used livestock to manage wildlife habitat, reduce five fire fuels, uh, to manage watershed characteristics, to do many kinds of wildland restoration practices. So it's not a terribly new idea, but what's happened in the last couple decades is we're really learning a lot more about how to use livestock to accomplish these goals in very specific and careful ways. So don't ever forget that grazing is a powerful tool. Here's a, a picture from the mountains of Montana. And what this picture shows you on the left, there was no sheep grazing. And so there's a lot of forbs, a very forb rich community. On the right hand side, there was sheep grazing and the sheep focused on the forbs and were able to pretty much remove it from the ecosystem, leaving only the grass behind. I'm not actually sure why you'd want to remove all those beautiful wildflowers from the mountains, a, a tall forb kind of community. But <laughs> it, it bears to stand that you could do it with sheep. Okay, here's another example. This is with goat grazing, taken by John Walker in Texas, this picture. And on the right-hand side was a pretty high density of goats. And goats were pretty effective at removing shrubs from that plant community. You can see some at the back side of that pasture, but right here at the at the front side, uh, there is, there's no shrubs. On the other hand, on the left-hand side of the slide, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side of that fence where there was no goat grazing, a lot of shrubs, uh, oak and juniper trees are common. So you want to get rid of shrubs, goats might be a tool to do that. This is an interesting slide because it was taken in Yellowstone National Park, and it doesn't have anything to do with livestock. There's no cows, sheep, or goats in Yellowstone National Park. On the left-hand side is an exclosure that was designed to try to increase uh, willows and aspens in the, along the riparian areas, and they were protecting those aspens from elk. So on the right-hand side is elk grazing and probably bison, and on, inside the exclosure was removal of grazing, and it allowed the willows and the aspens to flourish. So it doesn't always matter if the animal is domestic or not. It, grazing and herbivory is a powerful tool. I like these titles here. They're from newspaper and magazine articles that have been published over the last couple decades, and I collect these. And boy, these are great titles. Goats enlisted in the war on weeds. 
Um, weed eating goats provide herbicide alternative. Woolly weed eaters. I like this one from Nevada, which was uh, only use can stop wildfires. It was a project where they tried to use, uh, well, they effectively used uh, sheep on the edge of Carson City, Nevada, and they were able to reduce wildfire intensity at the city's edge. Probably a really fun idea is the idea of using ovines and vines. So ovines are sheep, they are ovines, and vines, of course, are the orchards, I'm sorry, are the vineyards that produce grapes for wine. So there was a pretty cool study where they used sheep among the grape vines to try to reduce weeds. Okay, we all know from previous parts of this uh, class that grazing has sort of a dual effect. If, it's, it, if you really graze heavily and not in a very controlled manner, you can increase the spread of weeds. You can cause a disturbance with livestock. Livestock can, tra can transport seeds. You could reduce the competition from the native plants and you could really promote the weeds. You could increase the density and uh, invasion of weeds on a site. On the other side, if you do grazing carefully, you could suppress those weeds. You could stress the weeds more than the desired plants. You could reduce brood biomass. You could reduce seed production. And basically, you just could reduce the competitive edge of those weeds against the native plants in the community. So both of these can uh, be results of grazing. You just have to be careful. Increasing the spread of weeds would be the result of uncontrolled or improper grazing. Suppressing weeds and benefiting the native plant communities or the desired plant communities would be an effect of targeted grazing in an integrated system, not just the grazing, but really including it in all of the things that that plant community needs to you know, propel itself in, and be healthy. Okay, truth be told, not all weeds are easy to control with targeted grazing. Oh, people try it. I've seen just nearly everything tried uh, to, where they use goats or sheep to try to control weeds, but they're not all easy. On the left-hand side of this chart are weeds that are relatively easy to control. Things like cheatgrass, kudzu, leafy spurge, and even star thistle can be uh, managed and controlled quite easily with the right animal. Knapweed's a little more difficult, but it can also, there's some good studies that show that sheep and others can control knapweed. Some plants that are much more difficult are juniper, depends on the species, western juniper that we have out here in Oregon and, and Idaho and Nevada is very difficult to control. Uh, blueberry juniper in Texas, not so much. It actually can be controlled fairly effectively with goats and sheep. One on the way far, uh, far side is something like salt cedar. Uh, just really difficult to control, difficult to get animals to eat, and diff difficult to control with targeted grazing. So targeted grazing spans that whole range from easy to difficult. Let's take a few of these and dig in a little bit deeper. When we start thinking about targeted grazing, it really is an innovation in grazing. It's a really new way to really focus on how do we change the season, the species, or even individual of animal that we use to manage vegetation. I mentioned season because season really does matter. Season is very important. So this study, this uh, is just a fence line contrast of one of the earliest grazing studies done in North America. It was at the US Sheep Experiment Station. And it was a simple study on the left-hand side they had a pasture where they grazed every spring. Every spring they'd, they'd put the sheep out on this pasture and then they would not come back in the fall. On the right-hand side is a pasture where those sheep came back every fall and did not graze in the spring. And what you can see is the pasture that was spring grazed had very few forbs because sheep like forbs. So they had it had very few forbs in it. On the right-hand side, the fall grazed pasture, by the time the sheep came back in the fall, those plants were dormant. So the sheep grazed through that pasture and they did not affect the forbs. So the fall grazed pasture in the spring when this picture was taken, were beautiful things like taper tip hawksbeard and balsam oryza had those beautiful yellow flowers. What you can't see here is the data also showed that on the left hand side there is more shrubs than on the right hand side because sheep tend to eat more shrubs in the fall. So fall grazing is one where the sheep would come and they would eat some of those shrubs and reduce their abundance on the ecosystem. It was a really long-term interesting study that shows how much season matters. So when you're doing targeted grazing it's important to to select the right season.
species also matters. Uh, cows eat grass, sheep eat a variety of forbs, shrubs, and grass, and goats really prefer shrubs. So depending on what species you're trying to control, it really makes sense to start with a species that likes that plant. Now animals have a lot of um, uh, plasticity, and so you can really increase the amount of, say, shrubs that cows would eat or grass that goats might eat, but it's good to start with that natural propensity that animals have because of their digestive system. A last kind of step that we use in targeted grazing to um, really get animals to focus in on the plants that we're trying to reduce is to select the right animals, train them, especially with early life experience, and then entice them to eat the plants that we're trying to get rid of. So that's the animal behavior part of this equation. Here's a study that I conducted with a graduate student uh, in uh, northern Idaho. Uh, you can see that the plant we were trying to control was yellow star thistle. And the picture there is from Google Earth, and I think it's really cool that you can look at your study and see it from Google Earth. But what you can see there is a lot of fairly small paddocks that, were, that we created to try to control uh, the species and season that we grazed. This was a fairly lent, uh, gentle uh, sloping bench uh, above uh, this, the uh, Clearwater Basin, and it was abundant with yellow star thistle, but it also had quite a few perennial grasses in the site. So our goal was to consider the species and season of grazing. So we were looking at the plant response to grazing of cattle, sheep, or none, and then we looked at three phen phenological stages. Uh, either in the bolting, I'm sorry, either in the ros rosette or in the bolting or in the flowering stage. Um, there were no goats in the study because there weren't many goats in the area when we first started the study. So we thought, well, maybe let's try using cattle and sheep, which, which are both very abundant in northern Idaho. Let's see how they do in using yellow star thistle for forage and um, suppressing it. This was a fully replicated study. We had four replications of all of our treatments, which meant that we had. 27 little paddocks that were 80 by 80 feet. So sometimes I think about the study and think it was probably just a test in fencing as much as a test of cattle and sheep. But we won. The fences held up and we were able to do the study. Here's what we found. We found that the only time where we saw cattle or sheep differ was in the flowering stage where cattle would go in and when the flowers had all those big spines on it, they would just quit eating the whole yellow star thistle. Sheep had a little different response on the right-hand side under the flowering uh, uh, mark. What you can see is that sheep um, did decrease the yellow star thistle a little bit, and it's because they stripped all the leaves off of it. They ate the leaves off the plant while it was flowering. Okay, but look at closely at this map. If you were going to try to control yellow star thistle um, with grazing, what would you do? Actually, the control on the left-hand side, that red bar, that had less yellow star thistle than any of the treatments we applied. So unfortunately, there was a grazing versus no grazing effect. And what it told us was that not grazing, you would have less yellow star thistle than if you grazed it. What was happening was when we grazed it, especially if we grazed it in the rosette stage, that the plant would um, stimulate secondary buds and that would create even more stems. So if we grazed it, it would create more stems and there would be higher density of plants and a higher density of seed heads. So that was pretty discouraging. Spent a lot of energy and time into finding out that if you wanted to get rid of yellow star thistle, the minimum you could do would keep it at bay, but we didn't see any evidence that you could use grazing to decrease yellow star thistle. So um, that made us go back and start thinking about what, which animals did we use? We knew that cattle are, mo cattle are mostly roughage eaters, and they tended to avoid the yellow star thistle. Sheep were intermediate, and they did eat some of those forbs, especially I mentioned that they stripped the leaves off the forbs. And goats are pretty interesting. They eat browse, but they'll also be, they're very nimble at eating forbs and such. So this got us thinking about whether we had used the right herbivore. And we'll tell more about that story in a minute. After being really discouraged about using goats and cattle to um, control yellow star thistle, I met this man in this graph, Ray Holes. Ray is the head of the prescriptive grazing, livestock grazing services. So he uses livestock to control vegetation. And he said, Karen, oh, we should try it. We should use goats. They're really effective. And I was so um, reluctant because I had had no 
I had no success with using targeted grazing against yellow star thistle. But we decided to give it a try in some really rough country, and we brought in the goats in the middle of the chart here. They're boar goats, and you can see they're kind of nibbling away at the yellow star thistle. Um, you see some couple of my graduate students that were involved in the project. Brianna Goering is, a, is the main student who worked on this project. And what you can see from this chart is it was really steep country. So we didn't have many options for uh, controlling yellow star thistle, except for goats or animals that could really use steep country. So what did we find? Well, first of all, we laid out 24 plots. Each plot was a paired plot where we put an area that was fenced, so it was no grazing inside, and it, right outside of it was an area that was grazed. And again, we had 24, and if you know anything about topo maps, you can see this map and you can see that the country was really steep. So it was a very large thousand or acre or more site, and it was really steep country. It was in near Bents Ridge. It was on Bents Ridge near a white bird creek in Idaho. And we did the grazing um, in the fall of several years. And here's what we found. We found that when you looked at ungrazed areas versus grazed area, here is a matched picture. On the left is the yellow star thistle inside of the exclosure where, where goats did not have access to it. On the right hand side is a picture where goats did eat the yellow star thistle. And it's really cool when you don't need data because the pictures are so informative. Um, and in fact, this is what we found time and time again inside the exclosures where livestock, where, cat, where goats were not grazing. A lot of yellow star thistle outside. Not so much. Yellow star thistle density and seed production and cover were all decreased when we had goat, graze, goat grazing. Forbes stay about the same and grass cover increase. So here's what the data look like. We look at the seed heads or the plants of yellow star thistle. There were far more in the ungrazed area inside the exclosures than in the grazed area outside the exclosures. If we look mostly at cover, just how much uh, of the area was covered by plants, there still wasn't a, a significant effect, a significant decrease in yellow star thistle cover in the grazed areas compared to the ungrazed areas. What's interesting is the grazed areas had more grass than the ungrazed areas. So when goats were coming through, they were being very selective of the yellow star thistle and they were increasing the amount of grass. Forbes, on the other hand, really didn't show much of a difference one way or the other. So the goats were really focusing on yellow star thistle releasing the grass. So in this case, the yellow, uh, goats were a very effective method to control yellow star thistle, and it has been used significantly in Idaho, Washington, and California. So goats are now recognized as a pretty effective tool for yellow star thistle control. Here's another interesting example. Um, for anyone that's traveled in the Southeast, you might have seen this plant, kudzu. This is kudzu, this big old leafy plant. On the left-hand side, a colleague of mine, uh, Jean-Marie Lugenbuehl, um, he was studying whether goats liked uh, this kudzu or not. And on the left-hand side, before grazing, solid stand of kudzu. Can't even see much grass in there. And then a year after grazing, um, boy, look at all the grass. So you would, it's clear that the goats came in and ate the kudzu and released the grass. And there was one other nice benefit to this study. Happy goats. It turns out that kudzu is really good forage for goats. And Joan Marie said that it, that the goats would just come in and they would just annihilate the, the um, kudzu. They just really liked it. It was really a healthy forage for them. They grew well. So in this case, it was really fairly easy match match where goats ate the target weed and they released the grass so that it was useful for other animals like cattle. A quick example of yellow, of, I'm sorry, of leafy spurge is a plant that we deal with throughout the plains and throughout the inner mountain west. And uh, it's really widespread. Goats and sheep both have been successfully used to um, control yellow, uh, leafy spurge. Um, it's considered a pretty good forage for sheep. There was a study done in Montana where they um, let sheep out in an area that was um, infested with leafy spurge and an area that was free of leafy spurge. And at the end of the year, the sheep that had grazed leafy spurge actually came back heavier than the ones that had grazed the native range without leafy spurge. So it's got a kind of a, a milky sap and that milky sap has energy. And if the animal is conditioned to eating it, they can actually get quite a lot of energy from it. Cattle are not so good at eating spurge. For whatever reason, they just don't have the ability or the digestive system to deal with it and they tend to avoid it. 
So there have been some cases where cattle producers in Montana have actually contracted sheep producers or formed cooperatives with sheep producers. So the sheep would come in, remove the leafy spurge, and leave the grass behind for cattle. And this picture here that you see on the left is a picture from the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station, just a little bit north, actually, of the Sheep Exper Experiment Station near, near Spencer. And there's a pasture there with those black critters in the back, which are goats. And you can see that there is no leafy spurge in their pasture. They are protecting it from leafy spurge. Here's an interesting study that was done quite a long time ago in the 50s. And this was done by Johnston and Peake, who were researchers trying to um, see if grazing could affect leafy spurge. And as leafy spurge was starting to come in in the plains, these two researchers uh, saw leafy spurge starting to increase in the 50s and they thought, well, I wonder if sheep would, uh, would decrease it. So they added sheep in 55 and wow, they were wildly successful. The leafy spurge went way down in the community, the grass increased and they were really able to keep the leafy spurge out of the pasture. I guess what the sad thing to me about this is that it was done in the 50s and the, public, the research was published in the 60s and for some reason, we, we took us years and years and years to think that maybe sheep could be a good control method for leafy spurge. So we have finally come all the way around, but we actually knew this in the 60s. Here's a cool uh, set of slides from uh, Deer Lodge uh, Valley in Montana. Uh, cooperative weed, ma weed management area there um, had an area near Deer Lodge where leafy spurge was taking over. All the yellow in this picture is leafy spurge right along a stream. Difficult often to spray weeds along a stream because the, we, won't, we don't want to put herbicides in the water to be washed down. So this was kind of a sensitive area where they didn't have a lot of options. So this weed management area said, well, maybe we should just go ahead and see if sheep would do the job. So this picture was taken the day before the sheep were brought in in 2002. And now the day before the sheep were brought in, a year later, way less leafy spurge. So in 2003, you see... Oh, there's some leafy spurge, especially in the background, but very little in the foreground. The, the prescription that they used here was simply to bring the sheep in until there was no yellow, there were no yellow heads anymore, and then they removed the sheep. If you're paying attention, there's no leafy spurge here, but there's also not a lot of other vegetation. So there was quite a bit of grazing on the grass and stuff, and it might have been a dry year. But the sheep did get rid of leafy spurge, but there might have been some non-target effects. The next year, the day before the sheep came in, it looked like this. Wow, so now we start to see the shrubs starting to come in, the, the um, sagebrush plants that would normally be kind of long, and those uplands in the stream are starting to increase. Very little leafy spurge. See a little bit of yellow flowers here and there, but very few leafy spurge plants. And then in 2005, again, the, we're starting to see a lot of the native plants coming in, those, those spurge plants, I'm sorry, those sagebrush plants. The grass is getting taller and very few leafy spurge plants. So the sheep were very effective. So in four years of sheep grazing, we went from a heavily infested area to an area that has gone back largely to native plants with, uh, with grasses and sagebrush. A similar study was, was done using goats in the Weezer River Corridor in Idaho, and this was uh, work that was done, done in cooperation with the BLM. And you can see on the left-hand side, one of the problems with leafy, I'm sorry, yeah, one of the problems with leafy spurge is that it has these old stems that build up over time, so it really becomes kind of impenetrable. And in 2003, they brought some goats in and they grazed up and down this Weezer River Corridor. And by 2008, you can see a radical reduction in the leafy spurge. You can also see an increase in bunches of grasses along that the stream munch. That's probably Great Basin Wild Dry. There's still leafy spurge there, but it's really gotten down to a level where there's not a lot of the, that big stemmy overstory and really has done a good job of in, you know, controlling that community. I'm going to talk a little bit about cheatgrass or downy brome because it's certainly a big challenge in managing ecosystems in Idaho and the Intermountain West. Um, cheatgrass, believe it or not, is quite nutritious when it's young. Everyone always thinks of it as a terrible weed, but it's, when it's young, it's really an important forage for wildlife and livestock because it grow, greens up very early in the spring. It's grazed readily by cattle and sheep. The key is that you have to remove cattle before the perennial grasses start to grow. Uh, otherwise, the, there will be a lot of pressure on those grasses and the cheatgrass will win out. 
So it's a lot about timing. Let's talk a little more about the timing. One of the earlier studies done on using grazing to control uh, cheatgrass was done in 2004 by Jay Davison of uh, Nevada. His study actually was designed to look at whether we could use sheep to, um, to control cheatgrass, but also do some restoration. And in the study from 2000 to 2003, he had uh, studies that were had sheep grazing and then studies without areas without sheep. So the sheep grazing and the control. 2000, there was um, more cheat grass in the control than the grazed area. 2001, again, almost no cheat grass in the in the grazed area, but quite a lot in the control. 2002, again, a lot more cheat grass in the control where it wasn't grazed. What's interesting is in 2002, at the end of that season, uh, Jay uh, took the sheep off and wanted to see what would happen the next year. And boy, by the next year, that, that community just rebounded and the cheatgrass was back so that by 2002, you couldn't hardly tell the area that was grazed or the area that was not grazed. So the take home message here is, yeah, you can use early spring grazing to reduce cheatgrass, but if you don't do it long enough and you don't get the seeds out of the ecosystem, it will bound right back. So cheatgrass is a really adaptable plant that will come right back if you reduce the pressure to it. Fortunately, uh, cheatgrass seeds don't last all that long. So if you can hold out for five or six or seven years, you can reduce a lot of the uh, cheatgrass seeds that are in the soil. And this effect may not occur after five or seven years of grazing. Another interesting study that was done in Northern Arizona by Loser et al., uh, they were looking at cattle um, grazing in three ways. One where cattle were removed, that's the green bars. One where there was moderate levels of grazing, that's, that's the yellow lines and bars. And then there was another study they had where it was high impact, so high levels of stocking rate in shorter durations, high impact grazing. What's interesting is, that the moderate grazing level had less cheat grass than the no grazing. So in this case, uh, from for several years in a row, uh, seven or eight, they were able to keep the cheat grass at lower levels by moderate cattle grazing, and that that was a lower cheat grass than no grazing. Um, the high impact grazing was roughly the same as moderate grazing until 2003. In 2000, from 2002 to 2003 in the study, there was really dry conditions. And what happened was, but with that really heavy grazing, that high impact grazing, they managed to do enough damage to the native plant communities that it really released the cheatgrass. So what we found was a pretty big increase in cheatgrass towards the end of the study. So high impact grazing created a great increase in cheatgrass after a drought year. So again, targeted grazing can be very effective, but you gotta be pretty careful because if you do it wrong, you can really um, make the situation worse. So those are a couple of snippets of information. Uh, if I were to put together everything that I've read and tried to think about how we might use grazing for cheatgrass, here's kind of my four part stage. If you don't do any grazing at all, it's likely that cheatgrass will increase. We have quite a few examples where areas that have never been grazed uh, kapukas that have lava all around them or high plateaus that have never been grazed, they have a lot of cheatgrass and it increases in those sites because they are the type of climate that cheatgrass is, is, um, is able to invade in. So no grazing doesn't necessarily mean no cheatgrass. No grazing just means that cheatgrass will come in and start to use that ecosystem because it's adapted to it. Early spring grazing, like the work that uh, Dr. Davison did, uh, really related to a suppressed suppression of cheatgrass. So that early, right, as soon as things start to green up, grazing at that time tends to be focused on cheatgrass and it allows the perennial grasses to um, be expressed. You wait too long, however, if you get just a little bit further into the season and you continue grazing, it's really likely that cheatgrass will increase. And that's because livestock will focus more on the perennial grasses and they'll shift the balance um, back to the perennial grasses and they'll, the cheatgrass will have an advantage then. There's some really new work being done last couple of years, um, five years or so out of Nevada, uh, that they're finding that if you graze in the winter, 
it's an interesting time that grazing in the winter can be a time to really reduce cheatgrass. Uh, what they think is happening there is that in the winter, of course, native grasses are not susceptible to damage. And if you remove some of that uh, litter off of the soil surface, it makes the seeds of cheatgrass more susceptible to frost and, and to cold and dry conditions. So by removing some of that overstory in the winter, those seeds become uh, less viable because, because of the conditions. So that's a really promising method that um, we might be able to use grazing in the dormant season to reduce cheatgrass. So the answer to the question is, does it, to the question, does grazing increase or decrease cheatgrass? The answer is yes, it does. It increases cheatgrass and sometimes, and it decreases at other times. It kind of goes back to that thought that targeted grazing is a powerful tool, but we need to be careful. If you want to learn more about using livestock um, to manage invasive annual grasses like cheatgrass, and but also red brome and um, Medusa head and other annual grasses. There's a really good uh, guide called the Green and Brown, gu Brown Guide, and it's put out by the e EBIPM, the Ecological Based Integrated um, Plant Management Group. Um, so if you go to www.ebipm.org and Google the Green and Brown Guide, you'll get all the step by step guidelines for when to apply animals and in what way to reduce that cheatgrass and Medusa head stands. Now, why do we hate cheatgrass so much? Well, we hate cheatgrass because it's great fuel um, for fire. And in the sagebrush step, uh, fire fuels are dangerous things because uh, the, the sagebrush step is not um, adapted to really frequent fires. And this is a map where every dot in this map shows uh, an area that was greater than 300 acres that burned between 2000. I'm sorry, between 1970 and 2007. And you can see that Idaho is really in the, the hot zone there. We have a lot of fires and they're really fueled a lot by this invasion of cheatgrass. So this is one of the reasons we're really concerned about cheatgrass. So could we use livestock to reduce cheatgrass and also the fuels? that are on rangeland to reduce wildland fire? Well, yeah, we sure can. we It's been done for generations, and we know just from fence line contrasts, like the ones that are in this picture, where a fire moves along and it comes to a fence and it stops because on the left-hand side, the area was not grazed, and on the right-hand side, it was. We know that grazing can be used to change the perimeter of the fire or the extent of the fire. We might be able to change the patchiness uh, by reducing some of the fuels, the fire might kind of finger out through the vegetation and be patchy. Uh, some recent research shows that grazing can decrease the intensity or the heat and the, and the real effect of the fire. Furthermore, grazing could affect the flame length and the rate of spread. It's not going to probably affect the likelihood of fire. Fire starts because it's dry and it's hot and there's fuel, but it could change the nature of the fire. Here's an example of, that Mike Pellant took um, over the Murphy Complex fire. And on the left-hand side, there was an ungress, ungrazed sagebrush area. So on the left of that yellow line is an area that was a sagebrush area and it was not grazed. So it burned really hot. You can see it was really dark color there. Then in the middle of the slide is an ungrazed area that was seeded. You can even see the lines of seeding. So it was a, a, a intermediate wheatgrass seeding. And the, the fire really got more cool, but it was ungrazed. So it was still uh, burned completely through that, through that um, seeded area. And then right down through the right-hand side is a straight line, and that straight line is a fence. And the fire moved from left to right in this uh, picture. And as it, when it got to the fence, what's really interesting is it got to a grazed seeding area. And as the fire hit that fence, it just sort of fingered out into the seeding. So this is the kind of thing where uh, we could manage fire in ecosystems, in sagebrush ecosystems, if it would just kind of finger out like that into, the, into an area. So grazing could help reduce that intensity and really kind of create that patchiness. We've done quite a bit of research in recent years on managing fuel loads with targeted grazing. This is a study that was done in the Oahe region in big sagebrush. 
And we had a couple of sites. Uh, Chris Schackschneider was the grad student on the study, and Dr. Ava Strand worked on it where they, they managed grazing in different patches. They really looked at how the fuel was affected by cattle, and then they did have the opportunity to burn this site. Uh, this was uh, burned at the same time, about at the same time as a soda fire. So we had a lot of BLM people that helped us to manage this fire, but we were able to burn these sites. And here's what we found. If you just look at flame length, for example, um, what, what was really interesting about the study was flame length was reduced. This blue and the orange line are lower than the control or the no grazing. So the low in utilization and the moderate utilization had lower flame lengths until about 20% shrubs happened in the community. And when you hit about 20% shrubs in the community, uh, then the, the fire is driven by shrub density and shrub cover, not by herbaceous biomass. The take home message is, grazing was influential in areas with less than 20% sagebrush, but it would be uh, difficult to use at least cattle grazing to manage fuels in areas where there were a lot of sage, where there was abundant sagebrush, 25% or so, uh, because uh, then the fire was carried by the shrubs and not by the grass. So yes, uh, targeted grazing can be used to reduce fuels, but not in all settings. Reducing uh, flame length is very important because uh, when a flame length is tall, the, the firefighters cannot use direct attack on the fire. So keeping flame length down to a safe level where the fire attack, the fire um, crew can attack the fire and, and keep it in a perimeter is very important. So reducing flame length is a potential outcome of targeted grazing and it's important for fighting fires. So targeted grazing can be, I hope I've given you some good examples of how it can be very effective. The one take home message that you should have from this is that it really depends on skill and knowledge. I've given you several examples where if it's done right, it's done easily and really well, it can be very effective. On the other hand, if you overdo it, don't get the timing right, you can actually make the situation worse with, worse with grazing. So it depends on the skill and knowledge of the targeted grazer. So I've talked a lot about the benefits of targeted grazing. It can be highly effective. You can improve pasture quality. It's considered a really environmentally friendly alternative because there's no pest, there's no pesticide residue. It has some effects on non-target species, but not as much as herbicides. And another cool thing is that you can convert those weeds in the ecosystem into something that you can sell at the market. Um, when you do herbicide control, you don't have anything to sell at the end of the year except the forage. But with targeted grazing, you can actually take those animals to the market, and that helps to sustain the grazing practice. It's considered a more sustainable control. It's feasible in really rough terrain. So those are some of the benefits of targeted grazing. But there are some real downsides. There's some real costs to targeted grazing. Uh, you know, people who are doing targeted grazing say that um, they often get calls and say, hey, I have some weeds. Why don't your sheep come eat them? They're good forage. Well, that's easier said than done. Targeted grazing costs money, it costs energy, it costs the animals, and there's often potential losses because animals are um, eating lower quality food and they're subject to, herb to uh, predators. There's fencing, there's water, there's herders, there's trailers that need to be paid for. Sometimes the weeds are very nutritious and animals will do well on them. Other times animals are used in specific ways and they actually are not as fat when they come off the weeds as if they had not been eating the weeds. So when we're trying to use livestock to control low quality plants, there may be reduced animal production. The, probably the biggest downside to targeted grazing is you just can't, you have to be there 24-7, 375. You can't hang the sheep in the barn when you're done with them. They're there and they need to eat every day. So one of the real challenges with targeted grazing is, is finding something that those sheep can do every day of the year, a place that the sheep or the goats or the cattle can graze every year. So uh, producers that do this, uh, contractors, uh, are getting better and better at this, but it is an everyday job that is quite a challenge. Uh, don't forget that targeted grazing is one of the many tools that we use and targeted grazing could be integrated with 
chemicals, mechanical herbicide or mechanical control method, methods, and even our biocontrol. And we're just starting to learn about how livestock could be used uh, to reduce the amount of chemicals we need, for example. Or they might be used to promote biocontrol by reducing some of the plants in the ecosystem. The biocontrol agents may really be able to start to have an effect. We might also be able to use goats and sheep or cattle to extend the life of a mechanical herbicide. I'm sorry, a mechanical treatment. So it's all an integrated system and sheep and goats and cattle in targeted grazing setting might be effective, but they might be more effective if you think of integrating with other techniques. If you want to know more about targeted grazing, we have a website, we being the Society for Range Management Targeted Grazing Committee, maintain a website at targetedgrazing.wordpress.com. One of the tools that we have on this website are several good handbooks, such as the Targeted Grazing, a natural approach to rangeland, to, I'm sorry, to, um, to vegetation management and landscape enhancement. There's also a really good book that is just on prescriptions for targeted grazing. We also have webinars of videos that we've um, worked on to help people understand the principles of targeted grazing. So I hope this gave you just a snippet of a few ideas of how we can use targeted grazing. Uh, it's still in its infancy, but I think it shows a lot of promise for vegetation management on landscapes.